everyone and welcome to cognitive tool number 12 in our cognitive toolbox problem solving dr. Ken Meyer here with you again you need to know how it works before you can solve the problem and I'll explain to you how that's very very significant in problem solving so problem solving on site here's an example I used to do a lot of this once upon a time. I used to repair packaging machines and pick and place robotics, particularly with injection and blow molding plastics machines. I'd arrive on site and be expected to read the symptoms, diagnose the cause, fix the issue in 30 minutes. Just not possible. There must have been a hundred different packaging machines, plastics and robotics machines, just impossible. So before you can examine the symptoms and estimate a diagnosis, you need to understand how the machine works. And there are a few ways to go about doing this. The first way is to be given the manuals and the circuit diagrams. Spend several hours familiarizing yourself with how the machine works then apply the symptoms and possible causes and that all takes a fair bit of time and effort and sometimes it would take several days to work out how a machine works. The second approach is to use experience from the machine log or other machines that you've worked on. Again, this is the result of time and effort. So quite often <clears throat> I kept a log of the machines that I would fix and if I was called back to a particular machine again a year later, six months later, etc., I would go through my little log and say, ah, last time I was here, here was the problem. So that was my second approach. And the third approach is to simply start replacing component parts willy-nilly until the machine is repaired. And unfortunately, I see that third option being used these days an awful lot of the time because people aren't prepared to make the effort to do option one or option two. They just start replacing components in the hope that it will fix the machine. So problem solving. All real problem solving starts with an operational knowledge, either through study and or experience. With electrical physics, Problem solving is actually twofold. There's two parts or layers to it. Because we can't deal directly with electricity, we often use modeling system of mathematics to some lesser or greater extent. So we have the problem of the physics and we have the problem of the modeling system, which is mathematics. The result is we have two levels of the machine to deal with. So the modeling system of mathematics is in and of itself large, complex, often very daunting. Unfortunately, in electrical physics, we're going to have to master the basics of algebra, trigonometry, and phasor diagrams. At the same time, we also have to learn the physics that that mathematics represents. And again, I'm going to hound this point again and again and again. You've got to make the effort to understand the physics and then the maths makes sense, not the other way around. Making sense of the maths will kind of point you in the right direction to the physics, but it will not in and of itself make sense of the physics. So most students make the mistake of trying to master the maths without understanding the physics it represents. This is so important. I find time and time again, students make the mistake of mastering the maths without mastering the physics. Now, mastering the maths is good. Don't hear me wrong. Mastering the maths is good, but it is not the overall answer. This actually looks like the easy path but actually it's not. Most only learn just enough of the maths to get by, by the seat of their pants, and never gain a good applied understanding of the physics, which is the thing you actually have to be competent in. 
you have to be competent at the physics, not necessarily the mathematics. Effective problem solving requires a parallel understanding of the physics and the maths. Yes, if you don't have the ability to manage both aspects of the problem, then your solution will often be very poor, slow to get to it, and unfortunately often wrong. The challenge here is in the world of parallel. For DC, the physics is simple, one-dimensional, and so also is the maths. As we progress, the concepts get more and more complex as we move up into complex numbers and complex maths. So we do with AC. So you're going to have to understand two parallel worlds, the parallel world of mathematics and the parallel world of the physics. There's these two aspects that need to be learnt together as we problem solve within electrotechnology. So there are seven basic steps to problem solving. And I've laid them out here. So the first one is, what is the physics at issue? And what is the mathematics that represents this problem? So it's about identifying the issue. Be clear about what the problem is. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Are we trying to solve a problem where we're trying to work out what a voltage is around a circuit? Can we identify what the problem is? And often the problem is presented to us word-based or in a text. Sometimes it's a circuit drawn and it's a question mark asking for what is the current, for example. So what is the physics at issue? What is the math that might represent this problem? Can you identify it? Can you be clear about what the problem is? The next is discriminate which variables are at play. Being unable to understand the variables, e.g. are we playing with voltage, resistance, current, frequency? What are the different variables in the particular circuit or the particular problem we're trying to solve? Can we discriminate? which variables are at play and what job are they doing in respect to each other. The third thing we need to do is examine the formula sheet for the maths that fits. So all the students everywhere in electrotechnology are given formula sheets. Effectively it's a list of all the possible solutions or options. So can you examine the formula sheet and determine which maths formula model will fit to solve the problem because in step one you're able to define what the problem is. Fourth, enter the values into the formula or the model, transpose it if required, so evaluate the options and make sure you can actually do the transpositional work within the formula, then it's just a matter of do the calculation on your calculator. Next is make a judgment. Does the answer make sense in the context and in its magnitude. So can you estimate what the answer should be? If you're playing with volts at a few amps, then the resistance will be in a few ohms. If your answer comes out in kilo ohms, you've got to say to yourself, that doesn't look right. Its magnitude is too big or its magnitude is too small. Can you make judgments? Can you estimate roughly the size of the answer. It's a way of checking yourself. So make sure your working is out, is logically laid out and the answer is underlined. So it's kind of documenting your answer. The better you get at laying your working out about being able to list the variables, write down the formula, then rewrite the formula with the variables substituted into it, then demonstrate how you've transposed the equation to make the variable you're looking for the subject of the formula and then do the maths. When the teacher comes to check it, he can see the logical way you've been thinking to solve the problem. So in the end, evaluate and check your process, the maths and the answer. So that's our seven steps. Easy to remember and by stepping through those seven things, you can solve pretty well anything in electrical physics. 
So what are the take-homes for problem solving in our world of electrical physics? One, remember, electrical is a parallel problem. We must start with the physics, so you need to know how your base machine works, the physics. How does the physics work? That's the base machine. Either through much study and much experimentation or lots of both. Two, select a formula that represents the physics. By knowing and understanding the physics and how it operates and how it interacts, then select the appropriate algebra, trigonometry, phase diagram, it's made much, much easier. I would argue once you know your physics really well, the actual formula just jumps off the page. As for mathematics, the only study method is to use practice. Practice, 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 and lots of it for the actual modeling system of mathematics. Three, check your approach and maths. Can you estimate the order of the calculation? So if you've got some idea how big it should be, make sure your answer has fallen within your estimation. And four, make sure you use neat setting out of a problem and its solution. This connection between your mind, your hand and your eye cannot be underestimated. It feeds your mental modeling system. Many of the cognitive tools that we're talking about in these 17 slides have to do with this. It's about building appropriate models and good laying out of mass calculations in electrical physics builds great mental models. So take the time to lay out your mathematics and your problem solving neatly, logically. The neater and more logical it is, the neater and more logical it will be in your brain and the much easier it will be to recall and apply when you need it. So I hope you've understood and enjoyed our seven steps of problem solving in electrical physics.